Welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a British perspective by two brothers who are, for the most part, relatively normal, insane guys, and we do this one topic at a time. We are Jeffrey Campos, me, an engineer and devil's advocate, and Benjamin de Campos, a designer and believer. We like to choose a topic of interest. Uh, we imagine a topic that we really feel we need to uh, investigate a little bit further. Uh, we spend some time researching it, and then we have a discussion, and we publish the notes. Those notes are available now. If you'd like to go to the website, eclecticist.co.uk, you can have a look at those and read while you listen. Uh, we do this because we believe the main benefit is the fostering of a greater understanding of the world before we all die, and hopefully we prompt some further thought and discussion from you, our listeners. The topic this time around will be near-death experience. The state of death, as it is commonly understood, is substantially defined by the fact that nothing ever returns from it. As risk abounds, individual organisms often narrowly escape death's icy fingers as a feature of life. During these close encounters, it is possible to experience the threshold, according to advocates of NDEs. Could such near misses afford glimpses of what may lie beyond? Is there any evidence to back up the claims? And if so, how is it conducted and what does it suggest? Now, we're not talking about erasure. Uh, a quick definition of NDE, uh, near-death experience, it is defined in the Oxford English Dictionary as an unparalleled visionary experience of light, peace, and joy reported by some people while in a critical state of unconsciousness. So I think we've all heard NDE bandied about, and it's been quite topical in the last few months. There have been a few interesting accounts of people who believe they have seen glimpses of an afterlife when they have near-death experiences. But of course, a near-death experience simply defines a person who has come close to death, <laughs> I suppose. Maybe standing too close to a motorway. Uh, that's a near-death experience. Uh, you know, nearly being run over is a near-death experience. Nearly falling off the, the edge of a cliff is a near-death experience. But I think for people who follow and have a great interest in claim and research NDEs, I think it means something a, a great deal more. What do you think? Yes, um, though I think that was uh, dangerously close to equivocation fallacy territory that you were just in. Um, I don't know anything about uh, any recent events. Are these news items you're talking about? Yeah, in, in the news, um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to track these recent <laughs> NDE um, articles down, but uh, I've been aware uh, that there have been some some interest in uh, NDE research. I mean, with certainly within the last five years, there's been a lot of interest um, and a few major claims and a few um, studies. But uh, it it never seems to be to be out of my radar. I think I always hear somebody going on either a, a, about a, a near death experience or an out of body experience. Um, so you know, there's a lot of interest in it. And there appears to be some study and research. Uh, and I, I find it interesting. I mean, it doesn't seem like a, a mainstream scientific topic by any means, but uh, perhaps it, it's creeping towards it. Well, the science is pretty thin on this. And reading it around, as I have been doing, um, there's very little evidence to suggest that any of these experiences happened while the brain actually wasn't working. It, it, indeed. Indeed. I, I, that's the major claim, I think. Yes, I mean, yeah, and this, that's quite a big deal. I mean, the science just simply isn't there. And the people who say the science is there, you just need to dig a little deep, but then you find out, ah, the science really isn't there. Yes. And also, it's this kind of thing, um, which is fodder to those people who really w want to posit supernatural and afterlife, all this kind of thing. Um you know, I mean, I'm I'm quite open to this, but I find I only get so far because there comes a point where I need to ha I need to actually believe in order to um, accept these claims. Yeah, I, I don't know if belief is required, but uh, I mean, if you're there are claims, so there's interest in in simply finding out whether or not those claims are sustainable. I mean, the principal claim, I mean, the, the general definition, the the term 
there's there's no dispute there. I mean, lots of people have near death experiences. And that is to say, they experience being at death's door, uh, but not actually dying. So a near death experience could be a not death experience, of course. But uh, the claims include um, if, if events uh, that are experienced, or rather experiences are had when the brain is inactive, that is completely shut down. So there's no activity in the brain whatsoever, and yet experience is occurring somehow. So that, that's a claim. And, and, and furthermore, the, uh, the soul or your personality or your consciousness uh, survives physical death or, or total brain shutdown. Somehow, these attributes that describe you um, continue, uh, even though your, your body has failed you. Uh, so-called non-local consciousness. So, you know, there's the duality concept that you actually float somewhere behind your body. Um, and also a claim is enhanced consciousness. So, you know, you're physically non-responsive uh, and yet you're having these fabulously ultra-clear, lucid, dream-like uh, episodes uh, while your, your brain is in total shutdown. So those are the the typical claims um, for NDEs, I think, and I, they are they are incredible claims, of course. But uh, the the symptoms of NDEs that inspire these claims is that people do come back from from severely physically traumatic um, events, and they have uh, you know they, they can recount dreams uh, very clearly, and they're completely convinced by them. So you think they're dreams? Well, I say dreams. I mean, experiences or they're recollecting something. I mean, they could be fabricating these events, you know, as they're speaking them. Uh, but they are uh, usually quite um, convinced that these are recollections of an experience that they, they had while they were under the knife in the operating theater, having a cardiac arrest or, or something like that, uh, some life-threatening event that they survived and uh, they come back with tales. And there are themes, the themes that, that you can generally find running through all of the accounts of these um, recollections include the tunnel seems to crop up a lot. And then there's voices, beings, and sometimes music and a sense of peace, uh, tranquility, and motion, usually some sort of unidirectional travel that I've, that I've noticed in a lot of these accounts which which is interesting because these themes of course you know if you're completely i suppose if you take a completely naturalistic uh, appraisal of all of these accounts and the themes therein you might speculate as to what this could mean and uh you know it doesn't take much imagination to think well you know your your brain is shutting down um you're 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 starting to your vision is starting to darken uh you're getting tunnel vision um there could be a bright light because there's something burning out in your retina uh the voices could be the voices that you can hear around you um music maybe that's the music of a an operating theater or 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 maybe their recollections or their memories that are surfacing because of the short circuiting of your brain and you're you know you're having these phantasmagorical memory recollections all crowding in and you're unable to interpret them and it's a jumble and who knows i mean obviously the brain is incredibly complicated and no one really knows thoroughly what's going on in there and and then we have the the added complication of death itself um you know what what, what actually is death and uh how do we know death has anything to do with it so the the proponents of ndes are suggesting that a near-death experience brings the experiencer to the threshold between the living world and whatever is beyond it. So the suggestion is, you know, you're seeing the pearly gates, but you're you're being pulled back into the land of the living, um, which is an amazing claim. But I but I think uh, there is strong arguments to suggest that there is a completely corporeal. Um, explanation for these experiences and uh and it definitely um 
I think it definitely makes you wonder about the nature of death itself. I mean, I've always thought death, just given the sophistication of our bodies and our brains, surely death is not instantaneous, you know, ever. You could argue that, you know, you're alive, you're alive, you're alive, you're alive, you're dead. Uh, but, you know, you're going to shut down in different areas at different times and, you know, th there's going to be effects. Uh, you know, maybe your sense of taste is the first thing that goes when you're dying or, or maybe, you know, you can hear all the way to the end, but you lose vision or, you know, there could be lots of different impairments. People can be different. Um, certainly, um, disease and, and trauma are, are all different and they'll have different effects. Uh, so who's to say that when you have a cardiac arrest, you know, in 20 seconds, you're completely dead, or maybe it's three minutes, maybe it's five minutes, maybe it's two minutes. Who knows? It's it's going to be a, a gradual process, even if it's a even if it's a quick process, it'll be a gradual process, if you know what I mean. And uh, lots of systems will, will shut down, and you know, there'd be a lot of communication because certainly, even after you're even after you're stone cold dead, there's still activity in your cells. You know, gases are building up, and you know the putre, I'm not talking about putrefaction here, but I'm just talking about general energetic activity in your cells, whether it's your cells or your bacterial cells, there's still movement going on. So, you know, we're a dynamic system. And for the NDE uh, believers to suggest that these experiences are occurring in a completely non-operational, non-functioning brain, it is a big leap. You know, it, that's a crazy thing to assert. Uh, and uh, the evidence that they usually cite for this is that the um, the EEG uh, has uh, is not detecting any electrical activity in the brain, um, but I mean, is it really examining every part of the brain? Uh, and what resolution is it examining at? I mean, you know, how often is it polling all of the information? And you know, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of questions. But if you're a true skeptic, you know, you wouldn't even get across the first hurdle. I think uh, with these accounts and explanations that I've heard. Yes, I agree with that. Um, a lot of people coming out of the woodwork uh, with these claims are Christians. They tend to be evangelical Christian types, and this sort of you know confirms their beliefs, or, or so they see it. Um, but also, interestingly, and this is also in Sam Harris's uh, article, he talks about people in other cultures, non-Christians, who have similar experiences, but not quite the same, which I think is, is something quite interesting about this. But I think what's more interesting is the chatter online about people who can recreate these experiences or have experiences that tally with these experiences that people talk about um, using various psychedelic drugs um, and being in a certain environment and all that kind of thing. Yes, well, um, uh, Oliver Sacks, who died very recently, he famously wrote a great book called Hallucinations. And it's just a book about how you could be completely convinced about a fact of reality in your experience through your senses. And in fact, um, it's a hallucination. It doesn't exist. Nobody else can see it. It's completely inside your imagination. But you're so utterly convinced that it's true that you would swear your life on it. You know, we're, we're slaves to our senses. And if our senses are passing along erroneous information, then how could we possibly know? We just couldn't <laughs> because we're so dependent on our senses. And I think um, delusion and um, hallucinations can be um, caused by chemical and biological agents. Uh, it's just, it's it just has to be that way, you know. If you if you start losing oxygen to your brain, well, it seems completely reasonable that you'll not be perceiving reality with the same kind of resolution as you might when you're perfectly healthy. So I think it's completely reasonable um, to imagine that the the different types of chemicals that are rushing around your body will have an effect on your general perception, which is you know this is proven with. Uh, hallucinogenic drugs and uh you know lots of studies on on drugs that uh affect cognition all of these things have been done
Yes, there's a drug that people are talking about online um, in this arena uh, called DMT, and um, they're calling it the like businessman's psychedelic because it just gives you this twenty minute um, like super trip rather than this you know five hour acid trip or whatever. But what's significant about it is this. Apparently, we all have this chemical in our brain to to begin with, and by taking more DMT, it somehow you know, triggers the DMT that's already in your brain, and then produces these um, NDE like uh, trips. So, um, so it seems like it, that's significant to me because we clearly already have this circuitry already in our brains. Yes, indeed, and uh, I can imagine. Um, a propensity for these sorts of visions or experiences during traumatic events uh, probably vary a- across, you know, different people types. Uh, there, there are lots of incredibly potent drugs natural, naturally floating about your system. And uh, again, trauma could increase the concentration, it could uh, reduce the concentration, and uh, given the combination of the trauma, uh, perhaps um, really interesting results. Will manifest, uh, but there are there are trends, and there are enough of uh, uh, trends and themes throughout the accounts of people who say they have had bizarre near death experiences that it has attracted a lot of uh, research and study, and uh, and also personalities. So I I, I was reading just a, about a few of the personalities in the sort of NDE space, and uh, they include uh, Pim Van Lommel. Uh, this man, uh, I think he's Dutch, uh, is a, a leading NDE researcher, and he's done a, an awful lot of of studies and uh, research. And I, I, I think he, I believe that he believes that there is some mechanism whereby the human consciousness can can survive, you know, major brain trauma to the point where perhaps all of human consciousness does not is not necessarily housed in the brain per se so you know maybe there are other brains in the human body and maybe these other brains actually supplement the neocortex in your skull uh, so there you know there are massive um, complexes of nerves in your gastrointestinal tract for instance that actually do a lot of thinking for you you know they, they really drive a lot of your your hormones and uh, produce a lot of your serotonin and uh, you know command quite a lot of authority in your body organism uh, and so maybe you know partially your consciousness lives in areas other than your brain which might which could possibly uh, explain a few of the um, seeming uh, phenomena with regards to a total shutdown of the brain. That's a very strange claim. Um, Eben Alexander, uh, and we'll talk about him, he's an American neurosurgeon who very famously had an NDE um, event when he uh, was in a coma, and he wrote a book about it. And then there's uh, Alex Zakiris. Uh, This is the man who hosts the podcast Skeptico, and he is a, a, a fervent believer in the dearth of scientific study in the NDE realm. He thinks there's, you know, the the scientific community just shun the whole topic and uh, that there's some sort of um, internecine um, block on all research. It's it's bizarre. Uh, But he has a very interesting uh, podcast. And Anita Morjani, she's the author of Dying to Be Me. Again, another, another bestseller. A book uh, just released about five years ago, I believe, and uh, she had cancer. Uh, she suffered for from cancer, um, very malignant cancer, for about for about four years, and then had a an an NDE, and then uh, you know was miraculously cured of most of the cancer, and uh, and she wrote a book about it, and uh, she's quite interesting about it. Uh, so you know there are a lot of a lot of people out there who are claiming to perform scientific research in the area. There are a lot of people who claim to have had experiences where they have 
come to um to to digest information that couldn't possibly have been learned during their waking lives so you know they have seen angels they have crossed crossed the um the philosophical rubicon into uh into heaven and yeah i think that's pretty suspect because i think that sort of experience you know that can be imagined you know there wasn't any like extra information that she she gleaned from this which is why i'm more interested in this anecdote um about the operating theater that has like a number generator on top of one of the cabinets and that way um if anyone were to have a uh, out of body experience they could then you know have a look around the operating theater and then see this number generator and then recount what this number said you know therefore proving that they really did actually have an out of body experience yeah i mean straight off the bat you can imagine that that could be corrupted you know somebody could tell them what that what that number was or they could guess potentially or you know they could otherwise arrive at what the correct number is through means that are not floating out of body and and, and viewing the number from above so i mean I, I there's limited use there i mean there was a um a study that was kicked off in 2008 uh along those lines and this is i think the biggest ever study of out of body and near death experiences and um there's a little a little a little abstract uh that i have here from science daily website and i quote in 2008 a large scale study involving 2060 patients from 15 hospitals in the united kingdom united states and austria were launched the aware that's awareness during resuscitation study sponsored by the university of southampton in the uk examined the broad range of mental experiences in relation to death researchers also tested the validity of conscious experiences using objective markers for the first time in a large study to determine whether claims of awareness compatible with out-of-body experiences correspond with real or hallucinatory events so this is a really big study and it was just primarily concerned with determining how aware people are when they've suffered cardiac arrests so when you have a cardiac arrest uh you know your, your blood stops flowing effectively so it stops flowing in your brain and when your brain doesn't have any blood flow then it really you know for all intents and purposes and as far as we can see it just shuts down because it just, it just can't operate without oxygen uh so this study wanted to see how long before um all all function in the brain stops after uh, the blood flow stops and also uh during resuscitation during the process of resuscitation how aware are the um are the patients uh which which is just you know diabolically difficult thing to measure because it's you know we're talking about seconds and we're talking about horrendous events that are you know happen all in lots of different ways uh, with lots of different people and it's you know it's such a, a busy um event uh you know with medical people and doctors and all the rest of it i just can't imagine how much value you could possibly get out of this so it's a very um ambitious study and it was completed and uh when the when the study was completed and they released their results there was a you know a brief flurry of interest in the media and I have a couple of the headlines here uh, from the independent newspaper life after death largest ever study provides evidence that out of body and near death experiences may be real <laughs> so i mean that <laughs> that's kind of a a weaselly meaningless um headline there what's the newspaper the independent mm. um and uh <laughs> so the, the findings um I've, I've linked to it here but uh the findings were yeah, i'm just having a look to see if i've actually written these down but there were there are 2060 uh cardiac arrest events that were considered in the study but out of 2060 only 101 really were valid and you know the 
the patients who were resuscitated were able to fill out a form and, and do the right kind of survey. Uh, and then out of those 101, basically one person had um, a convincing out-of-body experience account to say he, he, he described the operating theater, described the machines, described all of the operators and what was going on, you know, with incredible accuracy. So it's really, really, really convincing. Unfortunately, of the over 1,000 shelves that they erected in the hospitals where they put numbers and letters on the shelves above where you could normally see for out-of-body experiencers, this one person was in an area that didn't have any shelves. So nobody out of the 2060 um, cardiac arrest events uh, were able to read a number or a letter or an object from any of the shelves that are erected in these hospitals. So not one. And only one out of 2060 really gave a convincing account of an out-of-body experience. And of all of the near-death experiences that were recounted, there, they were thematic in that there is a long tunnel and there is strong light at the end of it and there may have been beings. Um, but, you know, they were, they were fairly random and, and there weren't very many of them. So all in all, it was one claimed out-of-body experience, which sounded interesting. So I think <laughs> from that study, and the link is in the notes, uh, that, you know, that's the best research that's been done uh, for NDE studies and, um, you know, awareness after brain death. I haven't been able to find any, any studies that are, that are more convincing, more convincingly scientific than that, unfortunately. Uh, there have been studies also on what happens when, um, you know, the, the, there's a death event or, or the, the, the probability of a death event is incredibly high. So it's a near-death event. And uh, the University of Michigan did a study in 2013, which basically confirms my suspicions that death is a process and not an event. And uh, it was the surge of neurophysiological coherence and connectivity in the dying brain study. I have a quotation. The brain is assumed to be inactive during cardiac arrest. However, the neurophysiological state of the brain immediately following cardiac arrest has not been systematically investigated until now. And that study revealed that there's a surge of activity in the brain. So it, it's almost as if at the point of death or major trauma or major oxygen loss, suddenly there's a real flurry of activity and, you know, everything lights up exactly the opposite of what was previously thought. So, you know, evidence is, is, is always coming in. <laughs> These studies are incredibly important because it obviously gives us a much better picture of uh, what might be happening inside someone's brain. But, but of course, it could be nothing at all. I mean, there could still be activity or, or some sort of residue of activity in the brain after a cardiac arrest or some other um, blood-stoppingly traumatic event. Uh, but any accounts or recollections that come from the the resuscitated patient might have been made up on the fly or something that subsequently was generated by their brain, not during the time their brain was inactive. Well, that's the big one. It is the big one. It is the big one. Um, I was just reading here uh, this study by Van Lummel. Is that how you say it? Yes. Um, in 2001, this study that he did, which sounds pretty convincing and, and reasonable. Until you get to the uh, section of criticism, which like totally overturns it com completely. Um, I should say that the people who have had these experience and have written books, uh, you list three of them. For me, when I hear they've written a book, their credibility just plummets because they're trying to sell a book. You know, they won't accept any counter evidence because they have a book. Yeah, because they 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 may you know they may be completely convinced, and, and they're writing a book because they believe they have something really important to say. Well, I don't doubt that they think they have something really important to say, but I can't help but think that they would have a completely closed mind to anything counter, because you know they don't want to look dumb um, with this book that they've just brought out. I mean, how many of these people do you think would ever um, withdraw their book because they suddenly uh, 
had all this evidence against them and they just thought, well, yeah, you're right there. Um, I don't think that would ever happen. So, I mean, I just basically questioned their integrity and um, just don't see how they could be objective at all. That's horrifically cynical of you. It is. Speaking of one of the personalities I mentioned earlier, Eben Alexander III. So I was reading about this fellow. He is a neurosurgeon. He's an American neurosurgeon. And um, I think it was in 2000... 12, he was yeah. trashed by Harris. Yeah, so he had a, a terrible illness, um, a microbial meningitis, I believe. Uh, he was incredibly ill, uh, very ill, and he was out of work at the time. And he was also facing, it is alleged, a $3 million malpractice lawsuit. Uh, so things were looking pretty bleak for him. Uh, but then he went into hospital and slipped into a coma from this meningitis and um, uh, awakened from the coma after having had a near-death experience and then wrote a best-selling book where he now has a, a movie deal as well. That's those, the, those are just facts. <laughs> um, but uh, I have a few long, I apologize, long quotations here, which I find really quite interesting, uh, from uh, Dr. Eben Alexander. So he had a near-death experience, but better than that, he claims he actually went to heaven. Now, when he says heaven, I, he's an American, a Southern American gentleman, and I automatically assume it's going to be heaven as imagined by the Christian faith. Um, and uh, there are very few uh, clear passages in the Bible uh, mentioning heaven or describing heaven. Amazingly, I couldn't find very many at all that are that that are clearly, you know, a, a description. But there is one. Um, it's in the Book of Revelations, and it is uh, chapter seven, verse nine. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. So that's sort of a description of heaven. So um, Eben Alexander fleshes, it, fleshes that out quite, quite significantly in his book, uh, which I skimmed. But this quotation here is... Uh, good explanation. And I quote, during my coma, my brain wasn't working improperly. It wasn't working at all. I now believe that this might have been what was responsible for the depth and intensity of the near-death experience that I myself underwent during it. Many of the NDEs reported happen when a person's heart has shut down for a while. In those cases, the neocortex is temporarily inactivated, but generally not too damaged provided that the flow of oxygenated blood is restored through cardiopulmonary resuscitation or reactivation of cardiac function within four minutes or so. But in my case, the neocortex was out of the picture. I was encountering the reality of a world of consciousness that existed completely free of the limitations of my physical brain. So this man is a neurosurgeon, um, so he's fairly well qualified when it comes to um, brain dysfunction uh, because he deal he, he deals with that on a, on a daily basis you know more qualified than somebody who isn't a neurosurgeon but 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 what he says here is he says um his brain wasn't working at all right it's pretty unscientific so total there. statement there it just it simply wasn't working at all uh it completely free of the limitations of my physical brain so he's he's very very confident that consciousness was occurring but his brain was completely not functioning. So that's a bit of a claim there. Uh, I don't know how he knows that. Now, I, I admit I haven't read his book in full. I intend to, but I haven't read it yet. Uh, it seems, I can't imagine how you would know that. I don't think we have the scientific instrumentation to measure absolutely every firing synapse in the brain at any particular moment. Um, I don't, you know, I can't. I, 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 can't imagine that he was in a ward that had absolutely no pun intended bleeding edge um computer hardware and software monitoring everything as much as possible uh you know things could have been missed um i don't see how he could be so sure on that score uh, but 
Continuing the quotation, Mine was in some ways a perfect storm of near-death experiences. As a practicing neurosurgeon, with decades of research and hands-on work in the operating room behind me, I was in a better-than-average position to judge not only the reality, but also the implications of what happened to me. Those implications are tremendous, beyond description. My experience showed me that the death of the body and the brain are not the end of consciousness, that human experience continues beyond the grave. More important, it continues under the gaze of a god who loves and cares about each one of us, and about where the universe itself and all the beings within it are ultimately going. And I will continue this quotation for a little bit longer. I saw the abundance of life throughout the countless universes, including some whose intelligence was advanced far beyond that of humanity. I saw that there are countless higher dimensions, but that the only way to know these dimensions is to enter and experience and experience them directly. They cannot be known or understood from lower dimensional space. So those were three quotations from his book, Proof of Heaven, which I've linked to in the notes. And not only is he adamant that all of his brain functionality was shut down, obviously temporarily because he recovered, uh, so he didn't actually die, of course, uh, but he traveled, he actually went somewhere and had experiences of things that he couldn't possibly have imagined during his uh, lucid moments on good old planet Earth. And he mentions, he mentions God, you know, he gets quite biblical there as well. And I have to say, what I read of his book came across as the kind of thing that I can imagine Oprah Winfrey giving a lot of time to. I think he was, he was actually interviewed by Oprah Winfrey. I should probably put that in the show notes, link to that YouTube video. But uh, is he a charlatan? Is he a con man? Is he genuine? Does he really believe it? Uh, did he actually experience what he says he experiences? Experienced. I mean, is this is it, is it worthwhile to investigate this, or or how should we uh, how should we judge his accounts? I think it's worthwhile investigating because of the hubbub that this guy has created. Certainly, and it's possible that he experienced what he claims he experienced, but. This um, the him being in debt thing is a little distracting uh, for me. And we should also say that um, this man has at length been trashed by Sam Harris in two blog posts um, that he wrote where he picked a number of holes in this guy's story um, in a very sober way, as is the style of, um, of Sam Harris. And he also pulled into question um, his qualifications. Uh, I think a lot of people are blinded by the fact that this guy is a neurosurgeon, um, assuming that because he's a neurosurgeon, therefore what he speaks about the brain clearly has merit. And Sam Harris makes a very convincing case as to why uh, you know, that shouldn't be the case. Um, also, the very unscientific um, language that he uses as well that's another big one and also um <laughs> sam harris also has a little bit of a um a little bit of a snide remark about how uh that issue of newsweek was the last print edition um i, I guess with the assumption of that the paper had just run into the ground because it was so garbage and uh that story was typical of that output but in conclusion, yes, I think that guy is a complete total charlatan. Yeah, I think I think it's difficult though. I mean, if if you do experience something that nobody else experienced, and you describe it, I, I suppose it's you're you know you're telling a story. Your whether or not your story is true is not necessarily something anybody can ever validate. So, no. uh, so you know, he, he, he says in, in, in the quotation I just read, he says, you know, you cannot, you have to experience this directly. It's not something you could ever possibly imagine. You actually have to be there. I, I was there and I saw it full stop and we have to take this guy's word for it you know he has all these qualifications well no I, I i don't think i don't think we have to take his word for it and i don't think he would say you have to take my word for it he's simply saying look 
these are the facts. This is what I experienced. Take it or leave it. You have to take my word for it. Well, no, he's he would probably say, look, take it or leave it. Uh, you can believe me. You can not believe me. I'm simply telling you what I believe happened. That's the end of it. That's the end of it. I'm not I'm not trying to say I'm not trying to convince you. I'm just saying I want to reassure you that there is something after death, uh, that it isn't oblivion, and that, you know, there is a, a mind-body duality, you know, proof, proof of heaven. And pe pe a lot of people want to believe this, of course. Well, he wrote a book. Yes, <laughs> he wrote a best-selling book. Uh, it sold extremely well. Um, and I think, again, you know, it's, we may see him as a confidence trickster, um, and a shameless charlatan, perhaps. Uh, but there is a... We're back to our good old friend confirmation bias again because there are an awful lot of people who want it to be true. They just really desperately want there to be an afterlife uh, and they really desperately want to to be the the temporary hosts of our biological robots, um, our bodies, as Alex Securus likes to say. Um, they don't want to be limited to this life or this body, and uh, you know they want to float up and enjoy a, a, a glowing relationship with the gods afterwards. So really, the question behind NDE, I mean, this is similar to creationism, in that creationism is... Uh, not creation. am I saying creationism? No. Um, ID, which stands for... Same thing. Well, there it is. <laughs> so ID is thinly veiled uh, creationism. Uh, and I think NDE is thinly veiled religion. It's just, you know, it, the proponents of NDE just simply want to, uh, they're looking for justification for their own belief system. And uh, maybe this is a, a quasi-scientific means to establish that. If it can be scientifically proven that consciousness extends beyond the physical death of the organism then you know great that's more grist for their mill yes and uh angels <laughs> so so the problem i have there he says that the proof of uh proof of heaven but um on my reading of the bible i, I didn't think anybody there wasn't anybody actually in heaven i could be badly wrong there but i thought he everybody is judged at the end of time by Jesus, and then we all go to heaven. But nobody's actually there now. There's just people who are queuing up. I think I think Elijah went to heaven, maybe. Enoch and Elijah, they, they went to heaven. Uh, but no one else. But, I mean, who knows? It's, it's not clear. It's basically anything you want. It can be anything you can imagine. And most people tend to imagine a Caribbean cruise. Forever. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, you know it, it could could very well be uh, whatever you like, uh, but uh, I think there's major logical problems there, and I think uh, the notion that there might be an afterlife, or you know, that we can, when we die, we approach and 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 cross a threshold into some sort of everlasting um, existence. Uh, it, it's it's logically problematic on lots of on lots of points um the there's the dead children problem in that uh you know when children die or parents die they're separated um i don't i don't see how you can logically square that without godlike shenaniganry that is to say you know the child will not be with the, its its parent when it's in heaven and vice versa so how is it heaven? I, it doesn't seem to make sense to me. <laughs> Where did you get that from? Why is the parent separated from the child? If a parent dies and leaves the child alive on earth, they are separated. Right. Right. Just just going just going by by any, any notion of the afterlife. If you were to if you were to um concede the existence of an afterlife, then separation is going to be you know a very common occurrence so if you are in heaven but you are not with your loved ones well then how heavenly could it possibly be not optimally heavenly i would have thought oh i see oh i see what you mean um i mean i can easily answer that 
But there is uh, another quandary which is um, sort of hinges on some of this. But to get around what you're saying, the child remains on Earth, and say the child lives to become an adult and then eventually dies. That span of time is less than the blink of an eye uh, in heaven, because heaven is an infinite amount of time. Yeah, but that doesn't get around it, because by the time the child dies, the child will no longer be a child. So the parent will never experience that child. But you're assuming that in heaven we still have bodies when we just have souls. Well, not not necessarily bodies. Right. Okay, well, that's that. Um, The other thing that I'd be interested to hear a response to is um, a hypothetical where you have a mother... A mother and a son, and the mother's a fervent believer, and the son is an atheist, and the mother um, is really worried that her son, who she loves, is going to go to hell. Now, when she dies and goes to heaven, and heaven is supposed to be this perfect place, how could it be this perfect place if her son is burning in hell? Yeah, not just not just in hell, but uh, enjoying infinite pain. <laughs> yes. So I think that one is more of a head scratcher than the other one. Yes. So, you know, if you came back and and there are accounts where um, those who have been at death's door and have had an experience and they are resuscitated, they are fairly horrified at what they saw and what the implications are. They think, wow, you know, there could be an afterlife and uh, it doesn't look good. (laughs) And I'm really scared and I don't want to die now ever. Because uh, I've I've seen what's out there and it's it's bleak. It's not oblivion. Um, it is something else, and uh, it's not for me. Thanks. So you know, there have been a lot of negative NDE um, recollections as well uh, as as you would imagine. So I think for sure, and and by that very fact, I think it's clear to me, or I'm willing to believe that really it's a a biological phenomenon. So, you know, I I just think things are shutting down and, you know, all kinds of strange exotic electrical activities in your brain that you're not not normally um, given privy to uh, are occurring. So you're seeing, you know, behind the scenes what's going on in the human body. And, you know, it's a scary place, (laughs) Uh, as has been extolled um, in popular science books for years. Uh, you know, you are not as you would imagine yourself to be. You know, there's lots of really queer things that are going on to to bring you reality. Yes. Uh, Yes. Well, I mean, we kind of touched on this earlier, uh, that I think any reasonable person or a reasonable person can see that the brain is clearly pretty awesome. And in our normal waking lives, we we get nowhere near the, uh, the, the special effects potential of our of what our brain can do you know people who have taken lsd can 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 tell you all sorts of crazy amazing things so i mean i can easily in my mind put nde down to just the brain being awesome and particularly as there's no evidence to suggest that the brain isn't functioning during these so so you believe that the supporters or believers in ndes are on shrinking ground as we gain more naturalistic scientific evidence to the contrary absolutely i i I'd, I'd have to agree i think um it's inevitable that uh further research is going to uh is going to reveal the process of death and decrepitude and exactly how our brains break down and the kinds of auditory and visual hallucinations that we uh we experience um, and when and when you experience them, I mean, you know, again, you don't have any reference points outside your own brain. So a hallucination is f- insanely real to you. Uh, and you really have to be told in no uncertain terms exactly what the processes are in order for you to try and get over your experiences and to, and, and to, to get a, an understanding of, of what's going on. And Oliver Sacks, again, he had, um, you know, he suffered from some severe um, cancer. And uh, he was experiencing all sorts of hallucinations, uh, which he wrote, you know, very, uh, very uh, lucidly about uh, the power of hallucinations and and, and delusion. Uh, it's incredible, and I think that's where that's what it is. So, 
I just don't think this the, the NDE movement is going to get very far. Unfortunately, uh, they'll they'll continue and uh, they'll have little uh, discoveries, I suppose, based on shaky evidence and uh, poorly designed studies. Uh, but ultimately, I think uh, they're just going to go away. And uh, NDE as a topic is always going to be interesting because there's always the what if question. You know, we 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 know about life, and we're we're in, incre- always increasing our knowledge about life uh, all the time uh, uh but when you die and when organisms die they really don't come back and uh you know just the the very grammar itself they don't come back back from where <laughs> there there's no they haven't gone to any place but i think this is it's never going to go away because uh we're animals and uh death is a, a scary thing but ultimately i think there's just oblivion well that's cheery um, I have a few definitions. Um, ID, by the way, you mentioned ID earlier. That's intelligent design. These are people who believe that there are designs and patterns in biology that could not possibly have evolved the complexity we see today, and therefore, in which infers that uh, there's a creator. Hence, the thinly veiled creationism comment. Um, Yes, an agent. Um, death, uh, again, this is the, the act or fact of dying, the end of life, the permanent cessation of the vital functions of a person, animal, plant, or other organism. Uh, that's the definition from the Oxford English Dictionary. And uh, death is what is not happening during NDEs. Clinical death, I looked up, and that just redirects to death, which I thought was quite interesting. I thought cl- clinical death had a very a very specific meaning, but uh, apparently it doesn't in the... Uh, the medical dictionary just uh, redirects to death, which I thought was quite interesting. Would there be some <laughs> subsection of the death page? Well, no, there, there's, in, in the medical dictionary, for sure, there's a huge, massive section and medical criteria. But I thought it would have been separated out into clinical death. Uh, delusion, the, act, the action of befooling with false impressions or beliefs, the fact or condition of being cheated and led to believe what is false. So you can delude someone, you can delude yourself, or you can be deluded uh, by conditions in the environment. Hallucination of perception is the uh, in the absence of external stimulus that has qualities of real perception. So I think a lot of that is happening uh, when your brain is starved of oxygen. Um, illusion, the state or condition of being deceived, misapprehension. So I think our senses can be confused and we can get the wrong end of the stick. And then owing to social traditions, uh, we can make up stories about it. Um, I, I wrote a, a short list of movies here <laughs> that sprung to mind when thinking about this sort of thing. Um, I, I've seen uh, a few of these movies just in the last couple of weeks uh, because they've been doing the rounds on Netflix and Amazon. Uh, so we have Flatliners, which I thoroughly enjoyed. This is uh, an 80s movie, I believe, with Julia Roberts and uh, uh, a few other sort of Brat Pack style actors. Um, the Sixth Sense. This is uh, Midnight Shenanigans, uh, his film, uh, which was quite good. Uh, it's really quite old now. It's quite worrying how long ago that came out. Uh, the Lovely Bones, which I think is Peter Jackson, the uh, the Hobbit, uh, which I haven't seen, but apparently it's quite good. Uh, when Dreams May Come, I think that's the one with Robin Williams, uh, which, I, which was terrible. Uh, there's Ghost, um, starring Demi Moore and Patrick Swayze. And Whoopi Goldberg. And Hoopy Goldberg, that's right. Uh, Beetlejuice, uh, which I thought was very good. 80s movie with uh, Michael Keaton. And Winona Ryder. Uh, Winona Ryder. Uh, Between Two Worlds, which is uh, uh, it's an old black and white film. I think it's from the, I don't know, late 40s, which is very good. I saw it a long time ago. I'd have to make a point of watching it again. Cloud Atlas, which is completely bizarre and very long and quite confusing. Relatively recent film. Uh, with um, Tom Hanks. Uh, Hereafter, um, I don't remember who's in that. I, I watched it and forgot it immediately. Kundun, which is a an interesting film, uh, quite a controversial film at the time. Uh, it's a Martin Scorsese film 
about the invasion of Tibet by the Chinese and the uh, and the escape of the Dalai Lama, um, who is he is a reincarnation. So, uh, in fact, Kundun, when it came out, the Chinese took such offense um, that Disney apologized by making Mulan, that film with the animated film with the female protagonist. Well, that was quite interesting. Uh, and The Fountain, which is, uh, again, a reasonably recent movie with um, with an Australian actor. I've forgotten his name. He plays Wolverine. And uh, huge action. That's it. Um, so there's just a few of the films that feature sort of a, an afterlife um, kind of tract. Uh, so it's very, you know, it's a very interesting topic in popular culture, I think. I don't think it'll ever go away. Um. Well, unless there's anything else, have we covered everything? Well, the afterlife will never go away as a topic because of so many believers in the afterlife. It's true, it's true. Although I don't think Christianity has the best, um, from from my reading, I don't think they have the best, the most appealing heaven. I think in the Quran, um, in chapter 13, uh, verse 20, well, chap, surah 13, uh, verse 23, Gardens of perpetual bliss, they shall enter there, as well as the righteous among their fathers, their spouses, and their offspring. Angels shall enter from every gate with the salutation. Peace be with you, that you persevered in patience. Now how excellent is the final home. Um, so I think heaven sounds pretty good in, in Islam. You would do anything to get to that heaven. Uh, it, it certainly sounds appealing. Um, well, anyway... Uh, you have been listening to Eclecticist, the podcast. Uh, we have a supporting page, eclecticist.co.uk, where we have uh, a list of all of our past programs and some information on forthcoming programs, uh, the next of which will be cinema. There is a contact form at the bottom if you want to pop along some feedback. Uh, we are on Twitter. Um, you can find our podcasts on iTunes and other podcast directories. Obviously, you don't need to do that because you're already listening. And we have some uh, music to play out with. Um, this is a piece called Reluctance to Return. It's from a band called Near Death Experience. Um, rather, than, that is their album, Near Death Experience. The band is called Out of Orion. And uh, it's pretty spooky. So uh, have a listen. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>